Hello. Hello. So if you follow modern practices, test coverage analysis is a lie, plain and simple. The tools are deficient. What they report is a false positive, and it leaves you with a false sense of security, vulnerable to regression, and unaware that this is even the case. Let's look at how and why that is and what to do about it. But first, a little bit about me. I've been coding professionally for uh, 26 years, 17 years in Ruby. Uh, I'm the founder of Seattle RB, uh, the first and oldest Ruby brigade in the world. Uh, I'm the author of Minitest, Flog, Flay, Debreed, Ruby Parser, and about 90 other gems. Uh, I have about 143 million downloaded gems, which at current count is about 1% of all, all dem gem downloads. Um, and I'm a developer's developer. I love building tools. I write more developer tools than I write Rails apps or anything else. Uh, and I run uh, CLRB Consulting, and this is the most text on any slide, so <laughs> we're good from here on out. I really hate these types of slides and talks. I really dislike this portion of, of talks, but um, I need new clients. <laughs> <laughs> so one other thing is I gave this talk uh, in November, so six months ago. And in that time, there have been three billion more downloads of gems in Ruby, which just blows me away. Anyways, setting expectations. Something I like to do in every single talk that I give, uh, I want to tell you up front what you're gonna get. This is a conceptual or an idea talk. Um, there is some code. Um, it is mostly fake. Uh, and this is meant for beginners on up. Um, this is about 100 and, well now, 77 slides, because I can't ever stop adding slides. Um, but it's about four slides a minute, which for me is a really easy pace. Um, I'm actually more comfortable doing six to eight, because otherwise I run under. Um, and I'm shooting for about 40 minutes. So <clears throat> let's start with some truth. Uh, that earthquake drill was not a preemptive response to the amazingness of this talk. A uh, little icebreaker here. Uh, you have no idea how much it sucks to follow Dave Thomas. <laughs> how do you compete with that? I mean, I've given something like 30 talks since I started uh, speaking on the, the Ruby tracks. Uh, and that's not counting the lightning talks and all the other bullshit that I've done. Uh, he's done hundreds, literally, I asked him. Hundreds of talks. So. How do you compete with that? He'll blow me away every time. And I, I just, I put this on here simply to show how awesome it is, how nonviolent Japan is, that the only gun in the entire emoji set is a water pistol. <laughs> but I think I found the secret watching Dave's talk. <laughs> Who knows, how, maybe this will be a better talk as a result. Uh, I actually have a lot of love for Dave. Uh, he's why I started coding in Ruby in the first place. Uh, we actually met in October of 2000 uh, when I took a workshop from Dave and Andy on their Pragmatic Programmer book. After the workshop, they tracked me down and tried to give me this new book on this unknown language called Ruby. But I'd just come from the vendor and bought one. And the rest is history. Also, speaking second, it has its pros, definitely. Uh, like after this, I actually get to be free and enjoy the talks. This is something I don't normally get to do as a speaker because I'm always working on adding more slides. Um, it's just something you can't help. Uh, but it also means that, um, and this is a speaking trick that I learned from, from Tenderlove, Aaron Patterson. Uh, I don't get to comment on any of the talks that I've seen except Dave's, which is a free five to ten minutes worth of filler that are given to me from the other speakers. And you get to poke at fun at them or say, you know, call out things that you really liked. Man, I just don't like these pointers anymore. Um, we're going to have a raffle and give away a, a presenter thing afterwards. <laughs> um, so for, for filler, I'm going to have to go meta and talk about speaking instead of actually speaking. So let's get started. 
So as a consultant, I get called to help out with teams that are struggling with huge and messy implementations, big ball of mud designs, or worse, design patternitis, or the over-eager use of patterns before needing them. Of course, they're often coupled with too few, if any, tests. And this makes it dangerous, if not impossible, for me to work on the code. I'm brought in after the fact. I don't know this code. Um, either I have to pair with a domain expert 100% of the time, and that isn't realistic for me or my clients, or I work alone, and then my pull requests just sit in limbo for months on end. And it's incredibly frustrating to be a fixer and not be able to enact change. Being a tool builder, I have loads of tools to help me do my work. Flog points out where the complexity lies and help, uh, lets me hone in on where the bad code is quickly. Flay points out refactoring opportunities, let me clean up the code quickly. Debreed points out whole methods that might not be used anymore and helps me delete entire fields of code. And of course, Minitest lets me write tests fast and clean and provide a lot of extra plugins. One of those plugins is Minitest Bisect, which makes it incredibly easy and fast to find and fix unstable tests. But what if there are no tests or too few tests? What do I do? Well, I'm not getting very far without resorting to full-time pairing or improving the tests themselves. But I don't know the system, and I don't know how I don't know what they haven't tested. I need a tool to help guide me. And that's done with code coverage analysis. But what is code coverage analysis? Um, it was introduced by Miller and Maloney in the communications of the ACM back in 1963. Because as Dave hinted at, everything that's good in computing is old, like me and Dave. In the simplest terms, perhaps too simple, it is the measurement of how much code your tests touch. But maybe a picture will help. Given an overtly simple implementation and tests for it, you can see that the tests hit both the initialize and add. There are no branches in here, so that's 100% coverage. There are a lot of different ways to me measure coverage, though. I don't like these terms, but they're prevalent in the industry. Uh, C0, has each line of the source code been executed? C1, uh, have control structures uh, like if, eval to true or false? C2, has each Boolean in each sub-expression eval to true and false? Functional coverage is simply what percentage of functions were called at all. Uh, it's not terribly useful in my opinion, but it has some utility, uh, like, uh, like my tool to breed. Um, and uh, at... Uh, RubyConf last year, there was a talk called Deletion Driven Development, and uh, it was fantastic. Um, C0, what statements are executed? Where statements equals a line of code, and that is an, a naive uh, expectation. Uh, in other words, what percentage of the lines of code were executed? Um, and this is an actual example of, of some client code and, and where they were getting hits and misses, where the, the well, well faded pink is misses. C1, are branches exhausted? Were all sides of the branch expressions exercised? Uh, where branching expressions are things like if and unless, case, rescues, anywhere where your program is going to jump and skip some code. And perhaps overkill uh, is every single sub-expression of a condition exercised independently, meaning can we ensure uh, that it's an or and expression with that precedence. And there's many ways that you can go about this, um, from the overly simplistic decision coverage to exhaustive and exhausting condition coverage, and then happy mediums that kind of merge the two. Parameter edge case coverage. Given a method argument with a known type, have you tested all the interesting types of data that that type can be? Uh, for strings, those types might be null, empty, white space only, a valid format, an invalid format, think dates or credit cards, uh, single byte data, and multi byte data. 
Uh, and then path coverage. Looking at the code in terms of the paths through a method, have you walked through all the paths? Entry and exit coverage. Uh, it's like a function call coverage for entry, but it also wants to exercise all explicit and implicit exits. And then state coverage, which is like parameter edge case coverage, uh, but for the states of the object instead of the arguments of a function. This obviously gets out of hand really quickly. So warning, there are metrics ahead, sorta. Um, I'd intended to fluff up my talk with a Dilbert cartoon here, uh, but it turns out that Scott Adams spews borderline racist and sexist drivel on his blog. Um, so this is not an image about gaming metrics in the workplace, and if you know me, you know what was censored. Um, quote, the reality is that women are treated differently by society for exactly the same reason that children and the mentally handicapped are treated differently. Fuck that guy. So, <laughs> people get stuck on, and by people I mean both engineers and managers, gamification of anything that involves numbers. Doing whatever it takes to push up the score, even if that means having worse code. And to me, code coverage sounds like something good and safe, a good thing that you want to have. But it's a false sense of security. Whereas having low coverage means that your tests are certainly insufficient, high coverage means nothing about the quality of your tests. You can still have bug-riddled code. Coverage and quality are orthogonal to each other. It seems to be a common misconception that high code coverage implies good testing and therefore good code. This is an actual code given to an engineer who was reporting a bug. And what does that even mean, 110%? I have no idea. It means you're lying. Um, OK, proof. Given the previous example and its associated tests, if you take the assertion and you remove it, you still have 100% coverage, but there's no verification that you're doing the right thing. And that's where TDD can come to the rescue. By intentionally writing a failing test and then only writing what it takes to make it pass and refactoring where possible, you're insured coverage and avoided gaming numbers. It's a natural fix with a simple process that has many other benefits, so you should do it. So, I'm going way too fast. <clears throat> Where is the state of the art for Ruby? <laughs> I am six minutes too fast already. More time for questions. Way, way more time for questions. Coverage is a standard tool that no one knows about, mostly because it ships with Ruby. It's fairly easy to use. You require and tell it to start early on in your run. You load and run your code, and then you grab the result at the end. But when you ask for the result, you receive a hash mapping a path to an array of nils and ints, where nil is non-code lines and zero is not covered. This is really not meant for users. It's meant to be used by other tools. Uh, but let's take a moment to see how it works. Coverage has hooks into the Ruby VM itself. You call coverage.start, and that sets some internal state in the Ruby VM. And when you load or evaluate any code, uh, and you don't need to understand this output at all, the compilation laces the code with extra instructions to record the coverage everywhere. As the code runs via your tests, each line that's run increments one of those numbers in that hash. And then you can call coverage.result, which get, returns a copy of the data, but then it turns the whole thing off, which is problematic for what I'm trying to solve, and I'll show that later. There is coverage.peakResult, which returns a copy of the data and lets you continue, but it's still problematic, as I will show. There's also a gem called SimpleCov. More people know about that because it's a gem. Its usage is entirely equivalent, mostly because it uses coverage internally, but it drastically improves the output. You get a nice overview with sortable columns, and each class has a detail page coloring the coverage. 
It doesn't seem to do much else. That's enough to actually make coverage usable, uh, but it has all the same flaws that coverage has. So what are those flaws? Nine minutes ahead of time. <clears throat> First, to describe them, I need a tangent for one minute. Hopefully three. Um, we need to talk first about what type of errors actually exist. For hopefully obvious reasons, statistics are very concerned with errors, and they've classified the types of errors. Type 1 error, or error of the first kind, uh, really creative naming, um, also known as a false positive, means you've detected something that you shouldn't have. If test x calls into class x, which calls into y, but you haven't verified Y's results at all, resulting in an er erroneously high percentage of coverage. Type 2 error, error of the second kind, also known as a false negative, means that you should not have detected something that, sorry, means that you've not detected something that you should have. In a similar scenario, but you can't map a test class to its implementation, resulting in an erroneously low percentage. An epiphany I had working on this talk was that both type 1 and type 2 errors are errors in the numerator. This assumes that you've sampled everything that you need, and statistics seems to assume that you always will. So there is an agreed nomenclature for when you haven't. I'm calling this a type 3 error, uh, or an error of mission. The similar scenario again, but you haven't even loaded Z resulting in an er erroneously high percentage because you haven't factored in zero over whatever. Error in the denominator. OK, so we've covered the types of errors. But before how we get into how I think that the Ruby tooling currently sucks, I must say in their defense that I don't think this is necessarily particular to Ruby. All code coverage tools that I know about have these problems. So let's get to the specifics, how coverage sucks how does coverage suck, and by extension, all tools that currently rely on it. I believe that there are two types of type 1 errors, the macro and the micro, that there are no type 2s currently, but I intend on fixing that problem, and that there are type 3 errors, possibly. For the macro type 1 error, tests hit implementation, and they do their thing, but you have coverage on something else that's totally untested. And this is a huge source of erroneously high coverage. We have this all over the place. On the micro side of things, because it's line oriented, C0 is really insufficient in a lot of ways. Any execution on line marks it as covered, even if there are multiple paths through the line. For type 2, because it simply deals with lines and files, coverage and symbol cuff do not have this problem. Uh, as I will show later, they can exist, and I intend on increasing them. Um, for type 3, it's entirely dependent on your sampling. Uh, so you need to ensure that all of your implementation is loaded, or your coverage analysis won't even know about it. Don't write, run, or load, or you're going to have high numbers. So, what can we do to improve this? I've created a gem that I called mini test coverage that I released at RubyConf last November. It also uses coverage because I can't instrument bytecode directly yet, uh, which means that this can suffer from some of the same problems. Um, but it does extend the C API, hopefully optionally. That adds a setter for the coverage so we can reset what the result is. Uh, I haven't been able to prove that this is needed yet because, ironically, it's hard to write tests for many test coverage. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it suggests using a new strategy of even doing coverage analysis. The first strategy change is to record a baseline for all of your implementation not under test. This addresses type 3 errors of omission. But what is a baseline? What does that even mean? Well, it's our minimum starting point, but ensures that all of your implementation is known. And that means ensuring that everything is loaded. We do that by loading all the implementation, but running no tests at all. 
And that's done really easily using a simple glob and require. Um, requiring coverage pruner serializes out the results while pruning out all the non-project code by path. Um, and this is wrapped into a command line tool that ships with the gem. The second strategy change. It only records the coverage for the class under tests or the cut. Which means that it simply ignores any coverage that might call outside the class. And it does this by trying to map from the test name back to the implementation name. But this is hard because there's nothing enforcing this and people deviate all the time. Um, the first problem is that the coverage tool reports everything by path. Classes don't necessarily map to a file cleanly in Ruby. This is, um, this is all by convention, but mistakes are made all the time. And likewise, test names don't necessarily map to their implementations. So the code has to be pretty smart to figure it out or pretty damn hacky, which is the way I'm currently leaning. And this is real code uh, from a client of mine, um, a real example of just how smart my regex needs to be to figure this stuff out uh, in order to get it right. And I'm still trying to come up with a better way to do this. Suggestions are welcome. What this means is that Minitest coverage is biased towards false negatives instead of false positives. Increased type 2 errors. And honestly, I think that's a better case overall because I would rather report erroneously low numbers and have to work more at getting them up than think that we're safe and not have the coverage that we actually have. This can be easily addressed by cleaning up your naming. I had a client that was looking at their code climate page and saying, we've got 83% coverage. That's pretty good. Seems pretty good. Um, but it was with tests that didn't load everything because Rails has their lazy loader. They're missing a lot of the denominator. And by starting with a full baseline, that number dropped to 51%. After fixing some of the type 2 errors in the naming, fixing some file names and fixing some test class names so they mapped to the implementations better, it went up to a much more honest 62%. And that'll let them realize where they were in reality uh, as to how much they were not testing. OK, next. I'm not sure this is useful yet, but many test coverage changes the runner to show each test class and report progress on each one. You'll often open up a new test class to test the same class over and over, um, either for contexts or uh, because you need different types of setup or for whatever reason. Um, this also helps make type 2 errors more obvious. And finally, my really basic report tool uh, doesn't sort on percentages the way a, a code climate does and, and the coverage tools do. It sorts by the amount of uncovered lines per file. This puts emphasis on the amount of untested code that you have. So what's left? I want to be able to hook into SimpleCov's nifty HTML reporter and possibly their file format to hook into other tools like Code Climate. I want to increase the ability to see coverage live in your editor. I'm essentially done with Emacs, um, but I could use help with Vim and uh, other text editors. And I want better error handling for type 2 errors, um, either more brains in the tool itself to help avoid them altogether, or better reporting and su suggestions on how to fix them. And some nifty ideas that I might want to do for the future, but I'm really unsure about. Um, if you reset to a baseline and record the coverage on a per test basis, then you can map the lines covered back to each test. And then you can use that to show heavy overlaps, kind of like a heat map uh, of where they came from. And if you do that without the cut filtering that I described before and some sort of, and I'm hand waving here, nifty visualization, you could readily identify places to isolate, to mock, to stub, to have the greatest effect on isolating your tests. So that's where I'm at with the tool. Um, the code is available at the URL below. Uh, I'd love some help with it, and any feedback is more than welcome. So if you are in the need of an experienced tool builder, uh, trainer or troubleshooter, or you need to optimize complex systems or processes, uh, this is exactly what I like to do. And please get in contact with me because I'm available. Thank you.
177 slides and I'm 15 minutes early. The question is, when I go to a new client that has low coverage and I help them increase the coverage, how much, how many bugs do I help them find? Uh, do the increased tests help them find? It's not me, because I don't know the domain. Well, that depends on the client. Uh, I have definitely had clients that by the time I got to their code base, they didn't uh, understand their own complexity and the model that they had. They couldn't. They couldn't refactor, not only because they, they didn't have the tests in place to be able to refactor safely, but because they had um, architected themselves into a corner and couldn't get back out of it. Uh, and they were arguing the great rewrite versus incremental refactoring, but they couldn't get their head around what the right increment would be um, through the path. And I've also had clients that um, had shoddy tests, but well-architected code. And so adding tests for that increased coverage such that I could refactor, but it was just increased coverage. It wasn't <laughs> exposing any bugs. Um, code Climate is a, a good example of well-architected code that didn't necessarily have all the tests that it needed. Um, and I've had other clients, uh, perhaps in this valley, that didn't. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, and it really depends on the client. So I think your thesis is uh, that that was a leading question because uh, you don't necessarily write tests to find bugs. Um, I wasn't sure about the second part you just made. Uh, just that re tests are to enable like, uh, confidence in code refactoring. Sure, yeah, so tests, we write tests to have confidence in our code. Um, Yes, but. Uh, one, by the time someone brings me in, since I'm more of a troubleshooter, um, they're already in a lot of pain and, and have coded themselves into a corner or, or whatever. Um, but there's always management. And it's a lot easier for management to justify my budget if I come in and start helping them write tests and they find bugs. That is a tangible, um, benefit that they can point to to justify the budget in the first place. If I come in and write a bunch of tests that don't bring them any value um, and confidence is subjective, bugs or not, I think is basically what it comes down to, um, then it starts to look like a waste and, and maybe my budget starts to disappear, which I don't want. Um, and quite honestly, the engineering manager doesn't want either because they're still painted into a corner and still need help getting out of it. Um, but yeah, absolutely, it is, it is definitely a leading question um, and it is definitely a problem in that um, you can write tests that don't find bugs and that can be perceived as a negative thing. How do I ensure that the work that I do to help them get the test coverage they need provides them the value that they need for today? For today, for the business and for what they And for the future. future. Um, I think the reality is that when I'm, when I'm coming into a client and helping them paint themselves or unpaint themselves from that corner, it always comes down to tech debt, right? So I'm being brought in to help them either pay down the tech debt or help them figure out how to pay down the tech debt. Uh, preferably the latter, because uh, if I just did the work in isolation, like they wouldn't learn from their mistakes and they would just paint themselves back in. Um, so I think by actually addressing it, and again, this is one of those subjective things. It's not something that you can really point to. I mean, I've got complexity tools and I've got um, code shape analyzers and all sorts of other things that, that we can use to be a little more objective about it, but the reality is like, we don't have some magic thing that goes, oh, you need these patterns here. Oh, you need to architect it this way. That's not something that's always going to be subjective. Um, but by coming in and helping them actively address their technical debt, I should be, not immediately, but I should be in the long term helping them increase their velocity. And that's something that you can measure kind of objectively as far as like feature points and that type of stuff goes. 
Um, so hopefully management can look at that over time and say, okay, well, it was worth it. Um, but it's, it's definitely one of those things. So you come in to a messy code base or you get hired at a new place. I mean, this isn't just about consulting at all. You get hired in a new place and they're like, congratulations, here's your load of crap. You own it now. And what do you do? Like, you're going to be in a slog for quite a while and paying down that first percent of the tech debt is the hardest thing to do. The 80th percent, pretty easy. By that time you're flying, but the first six months, always a slog. I mean, it depends on the domain and the architecture and yada, 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 but yeah. That's a really good question. And the uh, question was, uh, what type of strategy do I recommend for coming in and, and helping teams clean up when they have a need to ship? Um, that's hard. One of the things that I recommend, and I've got a, a, a blog post on my website um, about this, is um, expansion and contraction cycles in software. And so all software goes to these phases where you add stuff and it gets bigger and then you try to refactor it or remove stuff or distribute it into microservices or whatever, and it supposedly gets smaller. Um, what I like to do personally is work that into each iteration. Uh, I like two weeks of iteration. I hate calling it sprints because no one can sprint for that long. It's exhausting, <laughs> especially me. I'm not a runner. Um, and in, in the first week, we add features, and we work on uh, business side stuff. Fix bugs, uh, maybe, but definitely that's, that's where the expansion stuff goes. The second week, I want it being spent solely on paying down debt, fixing bugs, whatever is the most painful thing at that moment. Uh, and I've had situations where I, I've come into uh, a new employer and um, kind of surveyed the scene and saw that it was tech support that was just dying. And I was taking over the QA department, for example. Tech support was dying, and we're supposed to be hand in hand. You know, I'm supposed to be helping them figure out where the pain points are. They're supposed to be notifying that from customers. Um, it's kind of a bi-directional thing. Um, but the bug database sucked, and this sucked, and that sucked. And like, they were just being given the last percent of attention entirely. So I started doing iterations where I would add a feature that they were asking for, but I'd also sit there and ask them, what's the worst thing here? And the first one was it was crashing all the time. So I just focused on crashes. And the next one was uh, the reporting didn't sort right. So I just worked on getting that. And as a result, like we added the features that they needed because the tool wasn't done yet. But we also like stabilized really quickly and they realized that, oh, there's this person who's actually listening and paying attention and, and helping us like work this thing so that our jobs are much, much more smooth. Um, and by doing that, like there's a cultural thing going on as well. Um, they had gotten to the point where they realized that they weren't being paid attention to, so they stopped talking. And now there's this person who's listening and paying attention and dealing with their pain in a, in a you know, retroactive way, but dealing with it. And so they start talking again. And then it starts going back and forth. And it starts increasing the velocity of that. Um, and at the same time, the code base is getting better. The velocity is getting faster. Like, it was a slog at first, just figuring out how to stabilize the thing. But after that, you know, each step, each iteration was able to do more as a result. And that's part of that paying down the, the, the tech debt and making it so that your velocity is focused more on the health of the code than the pain of the code. One of you two. Flip a coin. Well, I'm curious if uh, you have, uh, in your experience, your metrics that uh, correlate uh, the better code coverage with maybe more stability in systems over time, or maybe uh, faster iterations for the coders uh, when, when they go to their not friends. Do I have any metrics correlating? The, 
leads to the better coverage with uh, some sort of tangible results over time? I mostly don't, uh, at least nothing objective. Um, I have not tried to tie code coverage numbers to um, any production data whatsoever. As far as code coverage numbers correlating to like development velocity, I don't have anything concrete because I don't believe most of the velocity data are real numbers. Um, back in the day when we were doing XP and we were putting minutes or hours on our three by five cards and following up with how much it actually took, those numbers were real, but now we've got this Fibonacci method of feature points that mean nothing at all, and so I don't trust them to, to mean anything, so I haven't bothered to try to correlate those. But I definitely have a, a strong gut feel that um, not necessarily code coverage, but having a complete, well-rounded, healthy test suite doesn't necessarily correlate to development velocity, but correlates to developer team health. Uh, correlates to sanity, stress, a bunch of things that are um, intangible but help the team as a whole. Um, but that's all gut. I guess what I'm trying to extract is what, what can we look for or try to attain when we're testing so we can improve our coverage and our test ourselves? That's a really good question. I, I don't know if I've got a dog in this fight. Like, I am definitely a mini test guy, duh. Um, I am definitely a mini test test guy, not a mini test spec guy. Uh, I am definitely um, a classic tester, not London school or mock driven tester. Uh, I mock last. That's the last thing I'm ever gonna do. And I will only do it to speed up my tests using real numbers. Um, I will never write a mock saying, oh, I need to disconnect from the database. If using the database is fine. Um, and, and for me, I want my tests under, well, for non-Rails apps, I want my tests under 10 seconds, preferably under a second. And for my Rails tests, well, you know, I assume there's going to be a CI and other things and I can kind of ignore it. But I really want a test file to run in less than 30 seconds. And I, Mostly, I'm fighting the Rails bootstrap and that mess called Bundler and their autoload, um, slowing down everything. If, if anything, like, if there's any message to take from this talk, it's to ignore all the code coverage stuff. It's to turn off Bundler's autoload. Um, that wastes more cycles in this room than anything. Um, but as long as your team has decided to do something, and you're doing it consistently. You don't have one rogue programmer going off and doing one crazy form and everyone else doing something else. I don't have a dog in the fight. I have my own opinions. They work great for me. That doesn't mean they work for you at all. But that's the thing with Rails, too. I mean, it works great for some people, but not for everybody. Yeah, and that's why there's the, the classic Rails stack or the Omakase whatevers. Uh, and then there's the folks that bring in our spec and slow their tests down even more. Um, there's, there's pros and cons to both. I mean, but what you're going to find, in my, my experience, is that the folks that immediately start off with RSpec, they're the London school. They're going to be mocking first and, and working towards having a, uh, their tests as isolated and disconnected as possible. Although they're not, they're not the Gary Bernhardts uh, and um, Corey Haynes. They don't have their, their stuff like completely disconnected from Rails itself. Um, but they found a, a, a style that works for them. And despite the fact that it wastes clock cycles running, you know, it works. It works for them. And if they want to pay that cost, that's fine. They might be ignorant of the cost, but they want to pay it, and so that's fine. Um, whereas the teams that I work on generally stay mock last, plain mini tests, no extra candy, um, because I'm, I'm focused on clock cycles. I want my tests to run fast and get out of my way. Um, but 
that works for us, that works for them. As long as you're testing, I don't really care. I don't care what tool you use, I don't care what style of testing you use, I just want you to test your damn stuff. What strategies do I have to make sure that my tests do the right thing? Um, I, think, I, think a, I think a good portion of that's just experience. Like, getting into the real pattern uh, that XP um, espoused in, in Yagni, um, fail first, um, and, and combining those really tightly, do the simplest thing that can possibly work, just means that you don't have this superfluous code that you write all over the place in, in, in other areas. Um, and as a result, it, it just works. But it's, it's kind of like chicken sexing. It's not something I can really teach you. You have to experience it uh, to figure it out. <laughs> or not, yeah, if you don't want to learn how to sex a chicken. On the Rails side, I'm, I'm a classic uh, fixtures kind of guy. I don't use f any of the factory libraries whatsoever because I, I don't need a library to instantiate an object for me. I would just instantiate the object if I need to. Um, so I don't really have any good suggestions for that other than do the simplest thing that could possibly work. If you need an object, make an object. Um, as far as whether you use fixtures or not, I don't really care. It's just easy to have a named thingy that way. And there's one over there, and I think that's gonna be our last. Uh, yeah, so going into a team, fixing other problems is a pretty big move. All of them. <laughs> All of them. Uh, and then being able to see your code um, fixed is also pretty significant. Thinking about getting the team, the team not to paint themselves in a the corner again, is there other things that you suggest to them, like training or culture or process, uh, beyond just immediately fixing their problem? Uh, yeah, so I generally, generally don't fix their problems. Um, I want people to learn from their mistakes. And they weren't a mistake at the time that they did it, they were a mistake after the fact. Um, but I want them to learn from that, so I would much rather, I'm, I call myself an optimizer, but I don't just optimize like run times, I optimize processes and, and people as well. Um, so I want to focus on uh, knowledge transfer, um, cross-pollination of knowledge transfer, so that we stop having that one guy who knows the thing, who's writing all the code, and doing a good part of, of painting into a corner. Um, and so I, I, I try to bring a balance, and I do that a lot through pairing and, and training and study groups and, and other forms that try to elevate the developers themselves rather than put a Band-Aid on their stuff, but have the systemic problems still exist. Thank you very much.